Thanks for coming on. I'm stoked to talk with you. That's really nice. Thank you. I've been looking forward to it myself. Nice. Nice. So yeah, man, let's, let's get into it. Um, you have been active in the consciousness world, the yogic world for a very long time. Um, I'd love to hear and unpack your journey uh, because I started diving into your book, Your Conscious, which I absolutely found so easy to follow, but yet so poignant to un unpacking some of the things like consciousness, uh, karma, the mind, and, and because I think so much, especially this day, day and age, we get lost in what these terms actually mean, how these things can apply to our life, make our lives better, more aware, more happy, more joyful. And, and what I've discovered in your book so far is literally like the cover says, it's got the key to unlocking this, this mystery that, we, that is hidden, like you said in the book, the, the mystery of its hidden uh, within us. Right. Um, and it's, it's right there. And yet, uh, we constantly seeking outside, outside validation, outside happiness, outside joy. And it is such a crazy phenomenon <laughs> and it's so right. And it's so seductive yeah, that's right. because that is the world that we see, feel, taste, smell, and yet what you're talking about is the wisdom, the stillness, the peace, the, the joy, the access of that, which is within. So anyway, I, 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 I just got excited about all this stuff because I have been dedicated my life to kind of learning about myself, right. At the end of the yeah. day. And, and I love, I, I was so excited about this book i'd love to hear anyway that was a lot but i'd love to hear your journey throughout the 70s uh your yogic practice and how you got to a point of wisdom to be able to tell these things that can be applicable to people i appreciate the opportunity uh you mentioned something that that struck uh, a chord with me and that is that uh unless esoterica has a practical application <laughs> i've always developed an allergic reaction to it <laughs> i i don't really have the energy or the time to give to esoterica without uh, an appropriate practical uh purpose right uh so for whatever reason i've been searching and I have the ability for it's, it's a God given uh, talent to be able to uh, connect the dots for people. First, I connect the dots for myself. So I'm, I'm only looking for uh, things that are practical to, to string together. Uh, but I've always, always had this passion to share what has worked for me. So I, I don't really teach from what I've read as much as I teach from what I have experienced personally myself. And I know that it's, it's practical. Uh, and that at a very early age led me uh, to uh, join scouts. I was a Cub Scout, I was a Boy Scout. Uh, I, I loved it. Why? Yeah. Cause it was so practical and uh, it, it, it provided you uh, these tools uh, for survival in life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had a conversation with my scout master once. I said, gee, the motto for scouting is be prepared. Be prepared for what, I, said, I asked. <laughs> <laughs> and he sort of laughed, but he, it was a stern laugh. He says, how would I know? <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's why we need to, we all need to learn this. So that led me uh, from scouting uh, to observe certain kinds of pain that I 
was experiencing in my life. Uh, a lot of the pain had to do with, well, the truth be known, it had a lot to do with the food I was eating. <laughs> I was raised in a stereotypical Jewish family. Food, like an Italian family, was sort of the centerpiece of, of the culture. Mm -hmm. And the more food that you ate, it always seemed to bring a smile to mama's face. <laughs> so, hey, I, I wanted to please my mother, and so I ate, and I ate, and I ate, and I got sick, and I and, and a tremendous amount of pain. So I was searching, once I got out of the house, I, I went off to school. I was searching for answers. And that led me to ultimately, it led me to Ayurvedic medical principles that taught me about my body, what makes my body unique. Uh, why was it when I was in high school, I couldn't uh, uh, keep up with cross country runners? Why, well, you just don't have that body type. You don't have that body constitution. And so I was eating food that was not easily digestible for this particular body type. So I started experimenting. I started uh, uh, swapping uh, different types of food for things that I found made me feel better physically, mentally, and emotionally. Well, there were so many changes in my life that I had a conversation with with my mother once. And this was after my father had passed. He, he was young. He was a, a chain smoking uh, uh, individual. And he died young. And my mom was gifted uh, the head of the household status for the children. So it was a lot of pressure on her and, and I and I I my heart went out to her I, I understood that she was responsible now. But she saw all these changes that were happening with me and and she said something so endearing that I carry it with me today. And she said. It's very uncomfortable for me all these changes that you're making. I just want to make sure that you don't give up your good sense of humor. <laughs> and I promised right then and there that I was not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's right. That, yes, I have a good sense of humor and uh, I don't intend to uh, give it up unless, unless it's part of that humor that I had used as a younger person uh, that was sarcastic that had a bit of a poison tip on the end. Mm. So I'm not a professional comedian. I, I can't be a Don Rickles who can get away with that and people don't really take it personally. So I began even with my humor to uh, wean out uh, any humor that had a poison tip on it that might injure somebody emotionally or mentally. Now, it's not that I didn't hear these funny one liners, I certainly did. And I chuckled silently to myself because I said, Hey, it is funny. But I sacrificed it rather than served it. So those are the types of uh, things that happened uh, pretty early. And after my father died, uh, uh, I began to search in earnest all the different spiritual traditions. Of course, I was born in the Jewish tradition, so I was fairly familiar with that, but I still studied uh, uh, some of the Torah and uh, Christianity, uh, even as a, a young kid. <laughs> uh, this, this goes back to the early uh, and mid-50s. Uh, on Sunday mornings, and I really knew nothing about Christmas or Easter, but uh, every once in a while during the year, there would be on Sunday morning at about uh, 630 or seven o'clock in the morning, because there were only like two or three channels uh, at that time. Uh, there were these uh, uh, little uh, uh, morality shows about Jesus. And I thought to myself, 
wow, he's a cool guy. He's just a really nice guy. He's going around helping people who are, have a hardship. I'd like to grow up like that, you know? I, I'd like to get a job like that. So, uh, so I, I studied Christianity, not necessarily churchianity, but uh, I, I began to peel back churchianity to find, uh, you know, well, what's the core here? And what's the core uh, of uh, the Buddha's teaching? And what's the, what's the core of uh, Muhammad's teaching? And when I found the perennial uh, philosophy and yoga science, I saw just as clear as the nose on my face that every single religion at its core is pure yoga. It's, it's pure yoga. So I concentrated on that and I studied and uh, I, I found a teacher or the teacher found me. Uh, my, my, my wife and I were watching Lilius Follin at the time. She was at, back in, in the early 70s, into mid 70s. She was uh, the uh, first, first lady of yoga. She lived in Cincinnati. She had a weekly yoga show syndicated through PBS. And one day she had a guest I don't know exactly who it was, but my best guess is it was Ram Das. He asked Ram Das, I believe, are there any Indian teachers teaching in the United States? And he mentioned Swami Rama. And, and that sort of uh, intrigued me. And uh, Janice, my wife and I wrote to his summer ashram in Pennsylvania for a book list. And we started studying his books, mm. had no desire to meet him. Uh, no Indian guru was going to tell us what to do. We, we felt that we uh, had already developed a, a small practice. But when I started reading his books, I said to uh, Janice once, gee, this sounds like this fellow is a scoutmaster. <laughs> he sounded like my scoutmaster. That's the way he taught. Wow. So I appreciated that very much. It wasn't until years later that we actually met him. So uh, it, it felt very pragmatic in what he was saying, very straightforward, do, he, he, you know, cause and effect, understanding right. the principle. And so, yeah, so back up just a second for people, maybe unpack your definition of yoga, right? So because mm -hmm. most people here in the West, we know they're thinking, I just did yoga today. <laughs> like I just stretched, I did my yoga class, I did whatever, but the, you're, but the definition is a lot bigger and broader from your perspective. Yes. So, but also, also simpler yeah. because uh, yoga really means union mm. on every level union on every level, but essentially for the human being, it means the union of the actions that we take in the world. And that would be thinking, speaking, and acting. The union with our act between our actions and our inner wisdom. Mm -hmm. So what gets us into trouble is the actions that we take in the world actually wind up in conflict with our inner wisdom. Mm -hmm. And that inner conflict then becomes the mother of all problems, uh, physiologically, uh, uh, within my own personal body, but then interpersonally with, uh, human relations and my relationships with animals and minerals and the, uh, and the climate, uh, and environment. So that's the way I see all of yoga is, is about union is, is there when I have a relationship and every relationship really essentially means that I have to take an action and even inaction is an action. But when I take an action, is it in alignment? Is it, is it a reflection of my inner wisdom? Or is it simply of the limited perspective of the loud, pushy voices in my mind, like from the ego or the senses that are clamoring or the unconscious mind? Mm -hmm. Yeah, or someone else's thoughts 
feelings, ideas, uh, and, and bless, bless all of them, our parents. Our parents mm-hmm. have their own limitations. They, they're our first teachers. And, and we come away with ideas, thoughts, feelings, emotions from them. And, and so it's that, again, that journeying of cultivating, listening to that wisdom. And, and that's where I think that pragmatic side to what you're talking about is so valuable. Because I think you can use severe examples of that, meaning that we know most times and not, we know when, let's say you're, I don't know, let's, I, I don't want to be polarizing, but, but like if I am a doctor and I know information, but I don't give that information, I give this other one because maybe I'm mandated at giving a medication uh, you know, it's things like that. Like, there's so many examples of maybe you have a better example where we we take on an idea, and it may not be ours, and it may not be in alignment with us, and then it and then it festers, right? It creates a a, a dissonance. Well, that puts that puts a lot of responsibility back on us because, uh, in a very pragmatic way, part of our spiritual practice is to inspect inspect our hard drive because there are a lot of faulty concepts that we have accepted because we were young we were impressionable we were vulnerable we want to be accepted and we carry that as the software of our mind you talked about mom and dad and grandma and grandpa and politicians and celebrities it's all there it's all on the hard drive and not that any of them have been malicious but now every, every relationship that we have is a teaching, but sometimes our mother and our father or grandma or grandpa or whoever influenced us was not necessarily teaching us what to do. They were actually modeling for us what not to do, how not to act. That's why I tell people that since I've been about 10 years old, when I fell in love with Elvis Presley, Elvis has been one of my most important gurus, my one of my most important teachers. So I fell in love when I was 10 with him. I gave so much attention to him and his music. And because I gave so much attention, uh, I learned an awful lot about the choices that he made in his life, many of which conflicted with my inner wisdom. So on a very practical level, my relationship with Elvis Presley, in part, was based on the fact that he was teaching me which burners on the stove were hot and which on the stove were not hot. And what were some of the big, biggest examples of what he was doing and what you knew was not correct? Well, uh, Chief among them, uh, I don't believe that uh, he took care of his body. He didn't love his body. Uh, he, he ate food that he loved, that were uh, lifestyle choices that acted as some kind of, uh, of a drug to ameliorate emotional pain that he had. Mm-hmm. So as I began changing food choices, I no longer ate food that I loved. When I say I, in that particular case, I'm talking about the personality. I, I no longer ate bagels and cream cheese and, and pies, and, and, but instead I started eating food that loved me, loved my brain, loved my eyes, loved my joints, loved my uh, liver, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And that's a great example that everyone can hear right now because every time we open our mouth it is is this in alignment with my body my mind my soul my spirit and is this moving me towards a life of that union or is it delaying that, 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 <laughs> exactly and that and i think that's where everyone can absolutely understand that this is very pragmatic because we know what we know and we also pretend not to know right 
right. then we just like, no, no, no. I just want to, this is a great example because people tell me this all the time. I just want to live. Right. So I just want to eat whatever I want and all this stuff. But what you're saying is there's a, there's a massive consequence to that. And, 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 and in ways it's a, so much of it is now we can measure biochemically, physically, emotionally, how emotionally can suppress the immune system instantaneously. Like there's a lot of things that we can measure, but there's also like, you know, that that is not correct for you. And yet you're still making that choice. So it goes against that union. Right. So, and, and so when I'm driving to work and I'm driving at 55, 60 miles an hour and some maniac is driving about 90 or a hundred and cuts me off in traffic and to avoid an accident, I have to slam on my brake. And in the process of that, what happens? A force of anger comes forward from my unconscious mind, and I am aware of intense anger. <laughs> the question uh, then must be asked, what am I going to do with this relationship? <laughs> and most of us identify with the anger, so much so that we, we, we say to the person uh, next to us, I'm angry. Oh, really? I didn't realize that human beings can become an emotion. <laughs> no, I'm not angry. I'm aware of anger. I have a relationship with anger. I have to take an action with the anger. And so the more I give it my attention, this anger, this anger, the poison from all these hormones coming forward in my physiology, they're poisoning me. They're poisoning me. So who am I hurting? Mm -hmm. Regardless of it being right or wrong, or that oh, it happened right. or it didn't that's happen, right. right? Correct. Absolutely. So what do we learn in fifth grade? Energy cannot be created, and it cannot be destroyed, but it can be transformed. Right. Wow. So I thought to myself, gee, if I, can, if I can transform ice into water and water into steam, is it possible that I can transform the debilitating, contractive, poisonous power of anger or fear or greed into some other beneficial form of energy? And the answer from yoga science is absolutely yes. And I think there's something you really, that I want to illuminate on that's very, very important. And that is, you're making the distinction between I am. If you're saying I am angry, you're declaring it. And now you've declared it and you've actually brought it in. And you are actually saying that is what you are. That's right. What, and what you're saying is that this is, a, an, an, this is an intensity coming up. This is an emotion. This is a feeling. This is this, a relationship. This is an experience, a relationship that I'm having, but it's not you, right? Yeah, and, so what does that immediately do? It creates a space between stimulus and response. Right. I become detached. Right. And in that space between stimulus and response lies my freedom of action. Mm. Because if there's no space between stimulus and response, I'm enslaved to faulty hardware, a software rather, faulty software. So, so, so yeah, so you're in the car, someone cuts you off. They clearly quote unquote did something wrong. That wasn't in the highest good of everyone around them. It put you in panic because you were trying to save your life. Instinctually, your instincts came in to save you, to protect you. But then once that programming comes in, you justify, you want to justify that this was wrong and therefore I have this emotion. But what you're saying, and this is a practice, right? Because yes, we're it's a practice, and there's no question about it. It's a practice. It's we're, an all, we're all yeah, because we're always automated. And then we we run around and we justify. Well, that person pulled me over or pulled pull in front of me and they almost killed us. And I had to put on my brakes and you know, blah, 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 blah. And what you're saying is there's a there's a level of separation but moreover, a level of freedom of choice that we're not allowing ourselves because if we, we haven't 
if you tell most people they're running around saying i'm sad i'm happy i'm the, they're just like all the time and but really who is that and what is that and or are these just witnessed emotions or could they be witnessed emotions so um that that to me is such a powerful concept to understand because it then eliminates victimization and it creates empowerment so how do you then want to respond back to what you're saying the union of how you want to respond okay well that's that's the critical important point now because you have to take an action you got all this all these hormones surging and then all this poison's coming so we're taught in yoga science that perfect comes from perfect and we were also taught in as very little children that god is perfect okay well let's just work uh, uh, uh let's just take that uh, example uh and 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 examine it a little bit that would mean if if everything comes to us for our highest good even though it's an ugly painful situation like being cut off in traffic that i feel that the personality feels justified to go after this fellow and maybe cut him off or whatever <clears throat> if there's actually a gift in in this experience that i just had what is it well a moment ago i had no awareness of the anger that lived in my unconscious mind i was unconscious of it but it still pulled the strings of the marionette unconsciously it dictated my thoughts my words and my actions unconsciously but thanks to this this terrible driver <laughs> that cut me off in traffic I now have a conscious relationship with anger. So once it makes its way, this anger or fear or greed from the unconscious to the conscious, once it's in my conscious mind, I can facilitate the transformation of that energy. Not until it's in my conscious mind, but once it's in my conscious mind, I can send that contractive, debilitating, poisonous energy to be transformed to a refinery. It's like refining crude oil. We don't use crude oil in, a, in an automobile or a truck because it doesn't work in a combustion engine, right? But if we sent the crude oil from Saudi Arabia to Texas to a refinery and asked those folks, to transform it into gasoline, hey, that'd be great. Okay, same with anger, same with fear, same with selfish desire, but you have to have a personal relationship with it so that it's in your conscious mind, then you can sacrifice it and sacrifice back to the Latin and then later to the Italian, sacrifaci, make it sacred, make this anger sacred by offering it back to the origin from which it came. What is the origin? Oh, there's only one origin. Whatever you call it, you can call it whatever you want to call it, but there's only one. You offer it back. You base your outer action on your inner wisdom. And that poisonous energy is transformed into healing energy, willpower, and creativity that are stored in the unconscious mind as to, as a strategic reserve that I can draw on from the potential state in any relationship. Mm. And that's I can do that all day long. Right. And that's the practice. So, yes. um, so, you know, say I'm that driver, I'm welling up of that anger it just happened. And now I'm aware I'm sitting here at the precipice of, I want to open my mouth. I want to hit the horn. I want to, road rage i want to do all that stuff but yet now i'm sitting here going okay let's practice this this anger i can feel my body my hormones everything welling up but i can but i know it now 
Correct. So how do I then, what do I do in transforming that as I'm sitting here with my about to explode? What is the best way for me to transmute and transforms and sacrifice that energy? How do I send it back to once it came? First, I think it's always helpful to be amused by the mind's <laughs> habitual reaction. <laughs> always be amused at the mind's habitual reaction. But then uh, be considerate, be loving, because we need an ego, we need an unconscious, we need senses. Uh, and so got to quiet them down a little bit and and just share with them that right now, we have the opportunity to transform this, to base our outer actions on our inner wisdom. So let's all of us, for the sake of an experiment, take this anger and offer it back to the origin from which it came. And just my intention of doing that will automatically transform it into healing energy, willpower, and creativity. Yeah, I love that because you can't possibly know on the in the mental realm where that or origin of that anger came from right? right i remember this one teacher told me you know you know an orange has juice in it and when life squeezes what comes out is what's within it right so it comes out so it's it, it, and that's what you're saying like even that idea of the, the whimsical mind seeing like, oh, wow, look at this intensity that's coming up. Right. And then even that thing, what, wherever that came from, whatever that is, I want to send that back to wherever it came and the great mystery of that whole journey. And even that alone is an empowering, powerful thing that only takes a half a second right that's right, it, that's right. It, it's not like it's a whole pull over do a ceremony light some incense that's not <laughs> you, know, you know that's not what that's this right. is but it's the, it's that stopping and changing your point of view about that whole fundamental thing and most people myself included i i like going what happened in the last three hours like i was completely like on un... like you said there's a certain part of the ego that is getting things done and is doing stuff hey, and does yeah. a good job. A lot of times I, I, I I'm, I'm thrilled with it. Yeah. I, I need a healthy ego right now to talk to you. For sure. Yeah. We have to operate. We don't want to get rid of it. Right. We just yeah. want to educate it and parent it. <laughs> yeah. And the, the parenting that we may not have gotten. That's uh, right. Well, no. but we actually did get it because we are uh, now we can see that mom and dad they were both teaching us what to do and what not to do. Yeah. So yeah. we're a lot more educated than we think. Yeah. And that's the, you know, the beautiful thing and the opportunity, which I always like, you know, like life's not happening to us. It's happening for us. Right. right. On, on every right. level. And so you can observe someone as a mentor and saying, Hey, I want to follow that great learning that they're showing me and I get to learn from. And also the, th the things and the people that do things not correctly, you can go like, wow, I'm watching that and they are causing a lot of harm to themselves and others or whatever. That's not what I want to do. So, so every bit of life can teach us, right? Mm. How, how we can then line up with who we are, what we are, what we care about and that inner wisdom. Um, and in that process, it's critically important, critically important that we don't forget to wear our doubting Thomas hat. What does we that mean? always, as a good scientist doing an experiment, even with the anger being cut off in traffic, we always have to be a doubting Thomas. But we're willing to do the experiment, right, just for the sake of science, to see what happens. Uh huh. But after we take that kind of skillful action rather than unskillful action, we have to stand back, examine, how do I feel? How do I feel physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, having sacrificed that anger rather than continue to poison myself? And my answer has always been, I felt better. 
And so then through personal experience, I know, not through hearsay, by reading Swami Rama or anybody else uh, that uh, might be offering some suggestions to me. No, you have to bring it in and experiment so that you become self-reliant. Don't be dependent on other people. Everything that you read or see on TV or the internet, it's all hearsay. We have no idea whether it's true or not. And in, in many, many cases, you see these talking heads on television, for example, they're often wrong, but they're never in doubt. But yet people just go along with it. Oh, did you see what uh, what's and so, so, so and so said? Well, and then then you you put that on the hard drive of your own mind and then you start saying those things. A lot so going whose on life right am now. I living? Whose life am I living? Exactly. There's a lot of that going on right now more than ever. And, right. and, and that and that's the you know, there's a there's an addictive side to this thing, too. Right. So there's a there's a there's a stress hormonal, addictive, vindictive, incessant part of this whole thing too, or else we wouldn't keep doing like, 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 what, what do you think? I don't know what the answer is, but what do you think that payoff is to keep? Because I don't know about you, but there's a lot of people that don't want to give that up. They don't want to, if they get pulled, if they get, you know, if someone pulls them, pulls in front of them and speeds in front of them and does something to them they don't want to give that up it, it, it's pretty intense right and, and we've all met those people that are really really heavy 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 reactive dramatic like this happened to me this happened to me every day what do you think that is what what is that addictive nature that they want to spend so much energy in that space and actually divorce that inner knowing why the hell is that happening so much well there's it's a high isn't it it's a high and it's an empowerment it's an i remember my mother uh uh, uh bless her soul uh she uh, she got addicted to anger mm. why because in the late afternoon of life in her late 80s and 90s uh it gave her power and uh, and it gave her a high mm -hmm. when she didn't have power over anything or anyone anymore. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And 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 so it, it, it's a powerful aphrodisiac uh, that 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 people who are not ready to self examine and make those kinds of experiments, it's, it's very easy uh, to uh, become addicted to it. And let's 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 remember one one thing that even before the addiction to any kind of hormone or substance of any kind, the first and most powerful addiction that human beings develop is the addiction to thinking thoughts that lead outside of ourselves for happiness and security and pleasure. So there are two kinds of thoughts. In Sanskrit, it's called pravriti and nivriti. Pravriti are the ones that most human beings are seriously addicted to. And those are the thoughts that lead out into the world, into the past of memory, out into the future of what if situations. Mm -hmm. And that's most of the thoughts we think lead us outside, desperately looking for happiness, health and security. But there are other words like mantras in meditation that lead us inward to the silence, to the fullness, to the wisdom, to the bliss. Mm -hmm. So most of our thinking process leads us outside. So it's only natural that we would become addict addicted to some of these external objects. Yeah, it's such a powerful thing. And, and I can't help but to think when you're talking about your mom's anger, my, my dad was so angry for mm -hmm. the majority of my life. And it was like the alarm clock literally every day, you know, uh, for probably 
18 years of my life, the first 18 years of my life. And, and until, you know, you see, you can, you can see those shifts until my dad started actually owning and honoring himself, even though he got, you know, he, he, he lost track again uh, later that I saw happiness in the first time when he actually started learning about who he was. Right. And, 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 and that's the whole thing. It's like, I don't know how many examples we have to go through to realize that if you're just pursuing all of this stuff outside without the cultivation of the inner world and of that wisdom, it's literally just, a, 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 it's just an empty pursuit. And then there, there becomes another pursuit and another pursuit and another pursuit. Um, it's and, it's there it's just like uh, the 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 uh, saturday morning cartoons uh, uh, at the movie theater <laughs> yeah. where where the uh, the anvil is dropped from uh, the 10th floor uh, uh, of a building and 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 flattens the cartoon character right. uh, to nothing and then all of a sudden the pops back up again <laughs> And then tries again, and then a safe is dropped on them, and then again flattened out. So that's the that's that's what the human beings. Yeah, that's kind of the, the 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 beautiful and crazy part of this existence, right? It is it is serving up these opportunities, and they could be perceived as pain and and difficult and and filled full of resentment and anger and shame and all of these things. But at a certain point in these investigations, I have never met a pain in my life that absolutely, I say this with every cell of my body, absolutely wasn't a massive gift to me. Right. Upon, well, upon looking at it from a whole perspective. So that, that reminds me of, a, a, of an important teaching story for me. So I'd like to share it with you. Mm. This goes back uh, close to 25 or 30 years ago. I had a very, very close personal family relationship with a man who had lower back pain. And as a young person, I had a lot of back pain because the, in the back, the lower back was my area where I stored most of my fear. So it caused pain in my back. So I said to this uh, re relative of mine, I said, you know, uh, I've been practicing uh, yoga, but also yoga science and transformation of energy. I could teach you a few things uh, because I know that your back pain, like mine, was not an operative uh, condition. Mm -hmm. Would you like me to teach you some things? And he looked at me and he said something that was it was very profound. He said, well, if I didn't have the pain in my back, how would I know who I was? Wow. So thoroughly identified with the pain. This is me. I'm the guy with the pain in my back. Well, no, that's not the truth. But, you know, Shakespeare tells us that thinking makes it so. So if you think it, then it's true for you. Oh, man. man, that is, I mean, that, that has so much ramifications yeah. in so many people. Like, listen, this doesn't mean that it minimizes people's massive struggle for injuries and disease and all of that stuff. That's right. But it speaks to something that's, again, we, you know, the first part of this conversation was about who are you? I am I anger am I back pain and he consciously yes. told you that well he you know he's a sarcastic fellow so he, <laughs> he thought it was a joke right. but with a with a tear rolling down the cheek it was funny right right but but it was a non the conversation ended because he didn't want it and and I wasn't about to force anything on him right so then you question anyone listening we all have aches and pains and issues and stuff so i i'm gonna i'm gonna fling this out to people right now who are you without your pain yes your, who are you without your anger who are who you are you without your name 
<laughs> totally. <laughs> exactly. Because your name is just a, a label that was given to you by your, your folks, yeah. and it really just uh, represents the habits of the mind. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, 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 it just kind of came up, and I'll bring it here. Like, I realized I was getting some some credible alternative doctors were doing scans and just, I had no, I don't really have any issues, but I always like to kind of use cool things and meet cool people and, and, you know, uncover things with my, my body using all kinds of cool energy medicine stuff and everything else. And, and there was some, there's some bacteria that one of the scans came up in my prostate and there was, you know, he said, there's nothing to really worry about, but, and, and I started going into that and kind of really sitting with it. And you know what was crazy? Just sitting with it without having a point of view. It was like I saw the lineage of my father, his grandfather, and then it just kept going. And it, and it brought about this awareness that there was a suppression of who we were as men who we wanted to be. And I remember at seven years, six or seven years old, I asked my father, what do you literally, as if it was yesterday, what do you want to be? What do you want to do? Right. And my dad told me all of these dreams and most of which he never exercised. Right. He never, he never allowed himself to have mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And I realized from that conversation and then going back, and this was like, you know, you know, sober, but trippy kind of, lucid experience of feeling the feeling into that quote unquote diagnosis i was like shit this is this is a line of energy mm -hmm. that is beyond my mind but it feels connected to so much so what could i do to transform this energy for me to step into something that i absolutely knew my dad didn't fully do so what could i do to continue to do that so it, it just brought beautiful. Beautiful. yeah it just brought that up and you're absolutely just speaking to this i think it's just this is subtle stuff but yet yeah. so infinitely powerful to switch and change people's lives to not so there's a, so even today it, it's so it's so uh, such a gift uh there's a whole science now a whole medical science epigenetics that <laughs> even though we're gifted these genes uh uh in the on position there's a, like an on off switch even if it's in the on position so that it's expressed that so that it will express for disease by changing our lifestyle choices we can turn it off yeah. we can turn it off yeah it's extraordinary yeah right so and literally what you're talking about and, and it, you know, listen, I've been in the food space and the health space for a very long time. And it's always that point where any, and my dad suffered addictions. I have addictions in my family and stuff. So it's like, it's comes to that place when if, if people aren't willing and able, if they're able, if they're not willing to change, there's, there's, there's really nothing you can do. No, no. But when, when they are willing to change, God, the, infinite power that you know what is your thoughts on this because now i'm just totally fascinated because i was thinking this this morning in a meditation then i went into a journal and i was like nature call it nature the universe but just using nature as a mm -hmm. as the metaphor of its infinite power nature is just powerfully nature it will take a seed and punch through concrete it it will it will literally grow a forest in chernobyl right it it, it is like you you leave a city. yeah you leave a city people leave it alone and nature takes over like you know it's just so powerful and so i was thinking and now i'm thinking even more if we let let that and let go and allow this essence that we are, which is nature, who and what could we be? Holy right. shit. And, and the key is our conscience. 
because our conscience is the only function of the mind that can access the super conscious portion of the mind where all this wisdom resides at the core of our being you know religionists call it the soul and if we can train and parent the ego senses and unconscious mind to give us their limited perspective and then to quiet down the conscience can reflect super conscious wisdom that can suggest to everyone the thought to think the word to speak and the action to take that will enable us to fulfill the purpose of our life without pain without misery and without bondage <laughs> that sounds really good why wouldn't anyone want to do that you know i have absolutely no idea other than they have other stuff they want to do right <laughs> right so, this yeah i mean it, it's so I mean, and that's what i love your book your conscious is such a let's let's break highlight a few of those things for me because i know you 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 karma is thrown around a lot it's it's people don't really know what it is and then some people think it has has to do with you know you know you have to believe in reincarnation it's got all these weird things the terminology gets so distorted sometimes um and then people don't receive the real messages and i'm i'm a really big fan i'm actually in the process of divorcing the term climate change right i'm mm -hmm. like i hate it because it's so politicized and has moved and you'd appreciate this as a moved away from common sense that's right like like the words again, are very powerful and and they're used by the culture to uh hypnotize us uh, it's like uh, people say, don't you have problems? I say, I have no problems because <laughs> I don't use the word problem anymore because I know that if I think to myself, I have a problem, I have a problem, I have a problem, my creative capacity is, sh is shut down. Right. So I say to people, I don't have any problems, but I have lots of situations. <laughs> <laughs> but, but listen, that is so important in the language that you're saying in the world yes. and that you say to yourself. And that is a practice. Yes, it is. You know, and you're, and again, you're not get coming from this as an esoteric, you know, not grounded perspective. You're actually coming from a very pragmatic tool that you're using to harness and, and shape and sharpen that which you want to give greater attention to. Right. And, and that's what I love about, I mean, I, I felt it in the words you were using in the book, but now just speaking to you, it's very clear. And that's where it's, 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 really, it's really just heartwarming to know that all this stuff is not out there. It's things for us to do. So maybe you can explain and kind of the, the 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 wisdom side of this thing or the difference between you know the your ego the unconscious and then really that bridge of the conscious mind and what that looks like to live from as opposed to taking orders from the others <laughs> well it's it's really endlessly interesting uh and most of us uh, had an inkling of it when we were young kids that it seemed to virtually all of us that there were different voices in our mind. And as it turns out, there are. There are four voices. There are four functions of the mind that, that create action in the body that bring about consequences. So that's a reference to the law of karma. Law of karma says thoughts lead to actions and actions lead to consequences. Newton saw that and he said, oh, well, that's, that's my third law of motion. For every object, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So thoughts lead to action, whether it's uh, words or physical deeds, and all of those actions lead to consequences. Well, most human beings already know the consequence we want to experience. We want to be happy. 
<clears throat> we want to be healthy. We want to be secure. The only question is, do we have a business plan? Have we been taught a business plan? No is the answer. Mm -hmm. But if we can learn to create a business plan, a philosophy of life that encourages us to base our outer action on our inner wisdom, we will look at the mind, look at the ego, senses, an unconscious mind and the conscience, see how they function and learn how to better coordinate them. The ego, which seems to me is hardwired to the reptilian brain, which means the ego always fears annihilation. Uh, identifies the ego identifies any unknown change to some form of death or relinquishment of control. That's ego. And the ego always insinuates itself in every relationship and divides everything up into pleasant and unpleasant, good and bad, like and dislike. And so the ego wants to reprise the pleasant and wants to avoid the unpleasant. Well, that can be okay, but I know personally from my own life experience that which appears as pleasant isn't always good for me. And that which appears as unpleasant isn't always bad for me. So if I blindly follow just the limited perspective of the ego, I'm going to be in a whole lot of pain. Mm -hmm. But I want to hear from the ego and what it's, and I want to welcome it, but I don't want it to run the show. So now the ego, like the senses and the unconscious mind, cannot make a decision. These are the three advisors that collect information from the world. And they then they become lobbyists. They lobby the conscience, which is the only function of the mind that can make a decision. That means every, every choice that we have ever made has actually been made by the conscience. And every choice we will ever make is always going to be made by the conscience. But if the ego senses and unconscious mind are unruly advocates creating anarchy in the mind, they're loud, they're pushy, they create so much noise in the mind, they're so certain that this is going to make us happy, this is going to make us secure, this is going to make us healthy. So certain, there's so much noise, the conscience will still make the choice. But because of all that noise, its capacity to reflect superconscious wisdom is diminished. So instead, it will simply rubber stamp the loudest voice in the mind. And that gets us into trouble. But if we can insinuate ourselves in an intimate relationship with our own mind, with the ego, the senses, and the unconscious mind, and parent them, we can provide relatively easy experiments like brushing your teeth for two minutes rather than having a second piece of apple pie mm -hmm. just for the sake of an experiment to see if what you thought was going to be unpleasant turned out to be pleasant and that's the kind of uh, of experiment that even the ego senses and unconscious mind believe after the fact that it wasn't so bad and and certainly i know from personal experience the senses delight in having the teeth cleaned rather than having the tongue feel all that mossiness on the front teeth because i haven't brushed for a couple of days or whatever <laughs> mm -hmm. and so if i can train the ego senses and unconscious mind to be quiet and then ask the conscience to weigh in, reflecting super conscious wisdom, then it's up to me as the parent to encourage everybody to do an experiment. And I, and I reinforce and I tell ego and senses and unconscious mind, hey, an experiment is an experiment. It's not forever. If it doesn't work out and you don't feel better, we won't do it again. 
but you know going in as the parent what the outcome is going to be. That's why you don't give the ego senses or unconscious mind anything too difficult to deal with. So what are some of the things that you would, I mean, meditation, uh, def- different technique, like what's, what's your, what's, what's some things that people can take away right now to start practicing aside from just, you know, hopefully the next time they're in the car and someone cuts them off they're at least remember this conversation and they may not allow themselves to be uh, yanked around so much, but what are some things that people can well, the, I think the most important thing for every human being to recognize is that every thought that comes into our awareness is not a command. It's not a command. It's just a suggestion of what Ooh, to give your attention to. And only the conscience knows for sure which thoughts are to be thought and which are not. So I... I I would appreciate it if anybody who's listening to this conversation, I would ask you not to believe a word I have said. (laughs) True. I don't want you to be dependent on me. But if anything rings true in your own life's experience, experiment with it. Be a doubting Thomas, but experiment with it and discover the truth for yourself. Mm Then you'll change your perspective, and by changing your perspective, you will definitely change your experience. Wow, that's that's beautiful. And I, I was smiling when you said that, and it's so powerful in the sense that whatever thought, feeling, or emotion comes up, it's not a command. It's just a suggestion. You don't have to act that way because we all have experiences where we've acted and then for the rest of the day or days after it's affecting us, right? Yeah. It, 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 you know, there's this expression of letting the bees out of the hive, right. hard, hard to put them back and right? they're, they're all over the place. It's a swarm. And, and that is, we all know that. And so I, I strongly encourage everyone because there's some great tools in your book, your conscious. And I just love your pragmatic way of unpacking this because this is, this is, this is everything being aware and more conscious so that we can make choices that are more in line with who we are, what we are, and what we actually want in life. Yeah. And it's, it's really a dire necessity. All you got to do is turn on the TV or read the evening paper. It's a dire necessity. And and it's up to you and me. Yeah. It's not up to anybody else. Yeah. Have to change ourselves first. And if if I can purify my own instrument of my own ignorance, then by changing my consciousness, you help to change the consciousness of the planet. There's only one consciousness. Bam. <laughs> that, that's it. Dude, thank you so much. This hey, has it's been it's really a pleasure. You, you it, it's been a delight. Literally oh, a delight. Yeah, I really love. I forgot we were even doing a podcast. It was just, it was just I, I know everyone's gonna love this. I and I'm just grateful. So thank you for uh bestowing your wisdom that you've been able to cultivate the truth and then be able to share it so eloquently with me and everyone listening. Where can people find you and where can people find the book? Uh, the book has its own uh, website at yourconscience.org, yourconscience.org. And uh, our website at the American Meditation Institute, uh, where I teach, is americanmeditation.org, americanmeditation.org beautiful thank you my new uh beautiful friend i really appreciate it